been a few days, and um, yes, I've been crying. You want to see real life? I'm going to show you real life. I am on day nine of my Suboxone withdrawal. Millions in dirty bills. Get ready, you are going to blow your mind. A secret bank cleaning stacks of drug money. Heavy bags uh, full of cash. And while authorities turn a blind eye. Notorious drug kingpin Pablo Escobar amassed an estimated $30 billion fortune by operating a drug cartel with customers all around the globe directly for the CIA selling cocaine to finance the fight against communism in Central America. Juan intelligence officials were, were covertly fueling the cocaine epidemic while Washington was simultaneously cracking down on it through its war on drugs. Former DEA agent turned whistleblower. We were the ones that were involved in sleeping with the, uh, with the drug cartels. Um, we allowed, uh, once again, uh, those third world countries to, to supply uh, uh, drugs to the United States and on the return trips, uh, we're bringing back weapons. Well, it's now more than 15 years since the U.S. invaded Afghanistan on the pretext of going after Osama bin Laden. The U.S. went into Afghanistan in reality largely to protect the heroin industry. Just as the Vietnam War was heavily driven by the fact that at that time most of the world's heroin was coming from the Golden Triangle in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. What you see all around me are fields upon fields of poppy. Afghanistan is in the grips of a drug epidemic many say is far more dangerous than the Taliban. These fields now supply 90% of the world's heroin and authorities appear unable or unwilling to stop those behind this multi-billion dollar trafficking industry. Some of the alleged kingpins targeted by police in Canada's multi-billion dollar fentanyl trade are associated with an organized crime group called the Big Circle Boys, investigators say. Among them, Paul King Jin. The Big Circle Boys originated in southern China with ties to military and police groups. They came to dominate the heroin trade in Canada and have now expanded into fentanyl, using Vancouver as their worldwide hub. Right from when he first started working as a casino investigator, Ross Alderson was pushing to stop the bags of cash. As head of anti-money laundering for the BC Lottery Corporation, he urged police to investigate the source of that illegal money. And one name stood out, Paul Jin. October 15, 2015, on the third floor of this building in Richmond, B.C., is the office of Silver International. Just how much money can be seen on this video obtained by W5, taken from Silver International's own security cameras. It's closing time, but one staff member is waiting for a special customer. We've sped up the video a bit. The client brings in a suitcase, and then together, they unpack bundles of $20 bills. You're watching an underground bank deposit. Each bundle is $20,000. And by the time they're done, $1.4 million sits on the floor. And it'll remain there all night because there's nowhere else to put the cash. The safes under the desk are full. Those bags by the window are also full of cash. The floor was the only place left to stack it. Money from drug dealers was being deposited into Silver International. Some of that cash would be loaned to gamblers and to money exchanges, who would repay their debts to one of 600 Silver International bank accounts located in China. And from there, that money would be transferred to drug suppliers of fentanyl in China, cocaine in Peru and Mexico, and then those drugs shipped to Canadian drug dealers to start the entire cycle all over again. It even has a name, the Vancouver model. The downtown east side 
It's the end of the line for Canada's down and out, and the heart of Canada's opioid crisis. Drug overdoses killed nearly a thousand people in this province last year. In this city, someone dies almost every day. This intersection is Maine and Hastings, but drug users call it pain and wastings. Fentanyl has found its way into knockoff prescription painkillers, into party drugs and cocaine. People are overdosing across the country. And it's not just killing addicts, it's killing teenagers in suburban neighborhoods just out to have a good time. If the symptoms didn't kill me outright, I'd kill myself. And I know that sounds dramatic, because to me, standing up here years later, whole and healthy, to me it sounds dramatic. But I believed it to my core, because I no longer had any hope that I would be normal again. The insomnia became unbearable. And after two days with virtually no sleep, I spent a whole night on the floor of our basement bathroom. I alternated between cooling my feverish head against the ceramic tiles and trying violently to throw up despite not having eaten anything in days. When Sadia found me at the end of the night, she was horrified and we got back on the phone. We called everyone. We called surgeons and pain docs and general practitioners, anyone we could find on the internet. And not a single one of them would help me. The few that we could speak with on the phone advised us to go back on the medication. A day like this yet. Um, I feel like I'm back in withdrawal. I feel like my body is tingling going through cold chills I, my anxiety is through the roof I, my, my face is literally tingling right now and I was at work I used to do all my drugs at work every day and I'm on my way home because I knew that if I didn't go home I would have relapsed today and I'm not doing that because, guys, if I relapse, I'm as good as dead. If I relapse, I'm as good as dead. One thing I know about myself, and I don't know a lot, trust me, but one thing that I know about myself is I'm not your typical addict. I can drink one beer and put it right down. I can take one anxiety pill or a quarter of one and, and not even like the feeling that it gives me. I can go out and do the drugs that I used to do and then just stop. And I've done it. And I'm not trying to be cocky because this is what I'm getting at. Pain pills are the one thing that I cannot control. I can't. And I know that about myself. So I know that if I mess up today, tomorrow it's over. If I mess up today, I might feel bad tonight, but tomorrow I'm gonna wake up and I'm gonna do the same thing. So I talked to my mom. First I called Kim. She was, you know, trying to get me through it. And then I talked to mom. And now I'm talking to you. It's so crazy when your worst enemy is yourself. It's the hardest thing to explain because 85% of me wants to stay clean. You know what I'm saying? Like 
85% of me is fighting this feeling. But then there's that 15% that just wants to go get high. And I don't know if it's because I've been enduring this, you know, for a week or eight days or whatever, but today's just a hard day. So, I love you guys, man. I'm gonna make this um, opiate withdrawal and and being an opiate addict is. I wouldn't wish it. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, man. I really wouldn't. I love y'all. Don't do drugs, man. This is why. This is why. Don't do them. I am fighting the fight of my life right now. You know that? Do you know that? And I'm, I'm pretty much talking to myself right now. I'm fighting the fight of my life. Because if I don't win this fight, I'm dead. I might go to a rehab or jail first, but I'm dead. I'm as good as dead. I love y'all. Peace. One more thing. This guy was my best friend. While I was in rehab, he overdosed on opiates. This is this is just one more reason. Well, I can't do it.